Hello, and thank you for joining the National Institute of Mental Health Office for Research on Disparities in Global Mental Health 2018 webinar series. This presentation is entitled Suicide Prevention and Collaborative Care Model. Please note all lines are in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during today's presentation, you may do so at any time through the Q&A pod located on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. This call is being recorded today, and it is now my pleasure to turn the call over to Andrea Horvas Marcus. Please go ahead, ma'am. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, I'd like to welcome to the Global Mental Health, Mental Health Disparities web webinar series. This uh, webinar series is uh, being sponsored by the Office for Research on Disparities and Global Mental Health. My name is Andrea Horvat Marquez. I'm the chief of the Mental Health Disparities Program, and our role here is to coordinate NIMH efforts in mental health disparities research. So we help to promote and support research and partnership initiatives in order to help to better understand the mechanisms and the factors that underlie disparities. And the goal is to fill the critical knowledge gaps that impact mental health, elimination of mental health disparities. So this uh, series is one example of that. And as you may be aware, September is the Suicide Prevention Month. And just a few days before that, we are holding this webinar, important webinar, and uh, uh, that's going to be talking about suicide. So today I'll be moderating this webinar, as we already mentioned, Suicide Prevention and Collaborative Care Model. This presentation will provide an overview of some opportunities to address suicide prevention while you're delivering mental health service in primary care using collaborative care model. Dr. Rod Smith will introduce some core features of the collaborative care model, focusing on how to utilize collaborative care model to prevent suicide and address mental health disparities. She's also going to be, be talking to us about the importance of addressing suicide in primary care level. So why suicide and why collaborative care and why prim doing this in primary care? Uh, well, um, Dr. Rodriguez is going to be able to answer all those questions for us, but I just want to highlight to you that suicide, suicide prevention is a top priority for NIMH, for NIH and for our director, uh, Dr. Gordon. Of course, you know that according to CDC in 2016, data has shown that suicide is the 10 leading cause of death overall in U.S., claiming more than 45,000 people in U.S. So NIH is working uh, with him, and, and NIH is working with NIH and other agencies and other uh, collab uh, partners to address that. And I'm just going to highlight for you before we start the meeting uh, some examples of that. NIH partners with the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention, helping supporting a comprehensive research agenda. And the goal is to reduce U.S. suicide rate by 20% in 10 years. Uh, doing those partnerships, NIH is also partnering with them to the Zero Suicide Initiative, and NIH currently funds several zero suicide grants. Uh, uh, we have here at NIH an expert on this area, Dr. Jane Pearson. Uh, you can reach out to her uh, about those grants. Uh, so there isn't any other efforts that NIH is doing. I won't have time to talk about them, but I'll be happy to share with you later if you have time, and you can also reach out to me. But I also want to highlight two other projects that are important. One is that NIMH intramural researchers develop a, a toolkit that calls Ask Suicide Screening Questions. So it's available to the public and it's to be used in medical settings in, 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 in everywhere. So there, I'm going to send you the link about that one too. And finally, I just want to highlight a an, an very relevant, important initiative that our office has been uh, partnering with the Health Service Administration, HRSA, to implement a two years uh, implementation collaboration, implementing collaborative care model in 11 nurse led safety net clinics that is being supported by HRSA. Uh, and NIH is supporting this initiative by doing a contract with AIM Center uh, and the University of Washington to provide training to those clinics to uh, implement collaborative care with uh, fidelity. So 
the next question where I said why primary care and why collaborative care, I'm sure that Dr. Anna Ratcliffe will be able to answer those questions for us. And so I would like to welcome her, Dr. Anna Ratcliffe. She's a national expert on collaborative care, especially on training teams to implement and deliver mental health treatment in primary care settings. Dr. Ratcliffe is director of AIM Center, AIM Center called uh, a, a, that means Advancing Integrated Care Solutions, and she's also director of the University of Washington Integrated Care Training Programs for residents and fellows. Uh, and that she's been mentoring, has so many experience in mentoring teams in primary care to deliver mental health care. She's also mentoring her son's uh, team, robotic team. So she's not only using her skills uh, in mental health, uh, but also in the communities in, with her own, in her own life. So I think I'm sure she's going to be able to provide us a lot of information here. So before I start, I just want to also remind you that this, call, this webinar is being recorded and it's going to be archived in our website. Uh, the speaker, we're going to have around one hour to, to, to speak and then we're going to have 25 minutes to 30 minutes of uh, q and R. I I want to have the last five minutes to summarize a little bit of the the main the main uh, the main the main uh, topics that was uh, raised on this this meeting, uh, and I want to ask you to please uh, write your questions uh, on the Q and I um, because we're going to have so many people today. We would like to the, to have the questions be writing as you were as she's been speaking, but I'm going to be asking those questions for her by the end of the the webinar. So please cope with us a little bit. Uh, and in case we don't have time to answer all those questions, Dr. Uh, Ratcliffe was kind enough to, tell, to send her to, to provide the email so you can directly send an email to her or to us, and we're gonna be, the, we're gonna be our best to answer your questions as soon as possible. So thank you very much for joining us. And uh, over to you, Anna. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here um, and um, be able to present this webinar. Um, I uh, am passionate about increasing access to mental health treatment and effective mental health treatment uh, and have had the privilege really of working in collaborative care since I finished my residency training in psychiatry at the University of Washington. So I have been working out in communities, uh, mostly safety net communities, uh, first delivering collaborative care as a psychiatric consultant to a primary care team um, in clinics throughout Washington State, um, and most recently having the opportunity to really lead implementation and training efforts uh, through my roles at the University of Washington. Uh, so today, I, I'm really excited to talk about how you might use collaborative care and implementation of collaborative care uh, to, as an opportunity to really address that tragic, those tragic numbers that um, uh, we talked about at the beginning, you know, the fact that over 45,000 people die by suicide every year in the United States. So um, let me go ahead and get started. Um, I think it is a good question to start with why are we talking about primary care when we're talking about suicide prevention? And I think that these numbers are really the reason that we start there. Um, and, it, and it's really going to be important to talk about what are the opportunities within primary care settings to really address those um, numbers and be able to be more likely to recognize and support and help people that are at risk for suicide. So. One of the things that was really striking to me when I started looking at the data around suicide is that nearly 50% of patients who die by suicide had seen their primary care provider in the month before um, they attempted suicide. And I think it's really important to understand um, that that creates a real opportunity uh, and then probably one of the most systematic opportunities for us to recognize and, and um, identify and support people at risk for suicide. Uh, we also know um, that um, most of the people who die by suicide um, have a behavioral health disorder, but that very few of these people actually receive access to mental health care in the last month of their life. And so thinking about how we can both increase access to mental health care in primary settings and how that may be an opportunity to go ahead and 
um, improve access um, to suicide prevention is a really important thing as the context for why we'll be talking about collaborative care today. So I want to talk a little bit about screening for suicide risk and, and where the kind of the current state of, of suicide um, screening um, before I move in to talk about collaborative care. So in May of 2014, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force really concluded that the current evidence around um, screening was insufficient to, recognize, uh, to recommend screening um, in uh, adolescents, adults, and other older adults in primary care. However, they continue to recommend screening for depression um, and recommend specifically delivery of collaborative care, mental health parity, and other depression care because of that high comorbidity. Um, the Joint Commission has, however, has actually issued a Sentinel uh, event alert in May around the same time, and this basically said that um, it, it is important to review each individual patient's personal and family medical history risk factors, um, and they actually put forth a recommendation to screen in three settings, specifically primary care, uh, behavioral health settings, and ED rooms. Um, so I think that there there is a growing um, movement to really think about broad screening for both depression and suicide risk within primary care settings. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to look at when I first started thinking about suicide prevention in primary care is what has been shown to be effective in terms of psychosocial interventions. Um, and this paper from 2000 and, um, in the 2000s has a nice um, summary of, of the common treatments that have been either demonstrated to prevent suicide attempts um, or to reduce suicidal ideation. And I think it's really important to note that most of these, um, many of these are um, therapies, um, collaborative assessment and management of suicidality, CAMS, um, and the collaborative care model are um, really more um, interventions that um, include systems and how you'd think about um, changing systems of care. So we will um, spend the majority of this, the time today on this presentation talking about what the collaborative care model is in, because it is one of these um, interventions that has been shown to reduce suicidal ideation um, in large trials. Uh, and at the end of this presentation, I'm going to come back and talk about what I think are the three core places where we might get um, really nice opportunities uh, to make a big difference around suicide prevention in primary care settings. So I like to start by really thinking about where does mental health care happen um, and, and why I think collaborative care is an opportunity to increase access to effective mental health care. Uh, so if you consider this pyramid and you, and you think about it as the spectrum of places that people might interact and actually engage in, in mental health treatment, um, you can start with thinking about that the majority of patients actually are in primary care settings or are managing their symptoms with self-management. And data around that show that it's about 60% of patients who get no care at all, um, so would be in self-management, and about 20% of patients in the whole population that needs care um, that get primary care set um, uh, in the primary care setting to address their mental health conditions. Um, I think that makes it the so that um, there's a real opportunity to enhance the quality of care by bringing in models like collaborative care to primary care settings um, because that's when we're most likely to actually capture patients, um, identify patients with depression and, in this case, um, that are at risk for suicide, and be able to intervene. Um, but I think it's important to understand that that's really expanding the capacity of primary care and there will still be many patients that need to be served in specialty care settings or be in the hospital. So it's also important to think about how you coordinate efforts across these levels of uh, care um, so that you can continue um, to have a good continuity of care between these different levels or steps of care. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that at the end because I think that's a really important opportunity um, if a patient is at, identified being at risk for suicide, how are we going to make sure that they don't fall through the cracks as we um, have to refer them or coordinate care around those, those people at risk? So um, what I'm going to do is spend the next um, 
a uh, little bit of this presentation, really talking about collaborative care um, as a better way to provide mental health services in primary care settings. Um, uh, this work, I've, I've largely been engaged in this work through my work at the AIM Center. And at the AIM Center site, we have a really nice seven-minute video called Daniel's Story, which really introduces what the patient experience and the team experience is of delivering collaborative care. So I think if you're excited about my presentation and, and haven't experienced collaborative care for yourself yet, this is a really good way to go and, and get a bit more of what is this really like for a patient and a family um, to be able to get their mental health care delivered in a primary care setting. So I encourage you um, to go to the AIMS website, and in the bottom left corner, um, you can find Daniel's story. Uh, so uh, collaborative care itself has a, is an incredibly strong evidence base. There are now more than 80 randomized controlled trials. That's getting close to 100 randomized controlled trials that have shown that collaborative care as a model um, is more effective than usual care for common mental health conditions, especially depression and anxiety. And we know that many of the patients that are at risk for suicide um, are struggling with these common mental health conditions. So I'm going to walk through what are the core components of collaborative care and then really talk a bit about the principles of collaborative care. And, and I do that because I, I both want to make sure people understand how collaborative care might be different than usual primary care. I also think it's really important to understand that even if your clinic system can't go straight to collaborative care, there are core principles that are really important to think about in any system of care and how you might be able to deliver those. So collaborative care starts in the primary care setting, and it starts really with a medical provider and the patient. And it really then says, how can we wrap around additional team members and practice supports to really make sure that we are systematically able to uh, identify and deliver treatment to patients uh, that are struggling with mental health conditions such as depression? Um, this is based off of the chronic illness model, so you'll see that this diagram has a lot of the core components that you might see in other chronic illness model um, care models, um, such as those used to address diabetes. Um, so you want to start by really thinking about how do you get that practice team um, ready to deliver treatment and care in a different way, um, and really thinking about the patient as a core member of the team, that um, educating them, activating them is going to be an important part of any care plan. In collaborative care, in addition to the primary care provider and the patient, you add two additional roles. Um, typically, um, this is a behavioral health care manager who will often be embedded in the primary care setting. This person is often a licensed social worker, could be a nurse, um, could be any kind of other counselor, someone with specialty behavioral health training. Um, they often are located in that primary care setting, and they can be available to assess the patient, as well as deliver brief interventions. In collaborative care, the psychiatric consultant um, is someone who's added to the team, and one of the real benefits of the psychiatric consultant um, role is that this is a person who may or may not actually have direct um, patient care with the patient um, and may or may not actually be located physically um, on site with the team. And the advantage of having a model where that psychiatric consultation doesn't have to be on the ground is that, that it really opens up the opportunity to use technology, such as simple technology, even the telephone, um, to allow psychiatric expertise to be delivered to that primary care setting, even if that psychiatrist isn't physically located close to that practice. Most of the psychiatric consultant's work is delivered through regular caseload reviews with the behavioral health care manager. These usually happen about once a week. Um, this was a big part of my job when I first did my work in, in, the, um, at, in the University of Washington. Um, I would get on the phone with my care manager, and I'd spend about an hour, um, and we'd talk about five to eight patients. For each of those patients, I'd provide a written case review, helping to clarify a diagnosis and develop a treatment plan um, that could include both evidence-based therapies delivered by the care manager and medications that would be prescribed by the primary care provider. In most collaborative care teams, that means the psychiatric consultant doesn't see most of the patients directly, um, but in many systems, that psychiatric consultant is available for that next step of care if, for example, a primary care provider has a direct question that they want to ask of the psychiatric consultant, or if you might need to see that patient directly. And a lot of programs are now using telepsychiatry approaches to be able to have that function of delivering a small percentage of patients to do in-person or direct services. 
Uh, in typical primary care um, settings, that's about 10% of the patients that end up needing to be seen um, in person. Collaborative care also introduced several important practice supports. So the first one of those is regular use of an outcome measure, the most common one being the PHQ-9 for depression. Uh, this is really important because one of the key aspects of collaborative care is that you're going to keep measuring whether or not the patient's getting better for their diagnosable mental health condition. And if they're not, then the team is going to work together to figure out what's the next treatment adjustment that you have to make. And I'll talk a little bit later about why we think that's really one of the important critical factors in the increased improvement you get in collaborative care. Another important factor is to use a population registry. And a population registry is a list of all the patients that have been identified that have needs um, and that, that we are going to continue as a team to look at that registry, engage those patients, adjust treatments until those patients are better or until we determine, gosh, they really need a higher level of care and we're going to help transfer them to a more specialty setting. Um, the, the next um, practice support or treatment protocols, um, this means the team is trained up to deliver evidence-based brief behavioral interventions that can be delivered in primary care settings. These have often been adjusted to be shorter duration sessions. For example, problem-solving treatment often is 30-minute sessions um, and often don't last as long as some of what you'll see in specialty settings. So six to 10 sessions is pretty common um, for most of the evidence-based behavioral interventions delivered in primary care. Um, and lastly is that psychiatric consultation, which I described to you. That's that ability for the um, psychiatric consultant to um, regularly look at case reviews and provide input um, to the team. So in the original trial um, of uh, one of the largest trials to date of collaborative care, the IMPACT study, um, collaborative care, as I just described it, um, was um, tested against usual care. So in this study, 1,801 patients um, were randomized at the patient level um, to either usual care, the primary care provider could do anything that they'd normally do, um, or collaborative care, where they would actually get all of those practice supports that I just described. And in that study, um, they found that in collaborative care, twice as many people improved. So there's a 50% or greater improvement in depression at 12 months um, for, for, the, for approximately 50% of the population. Um, and this doubled the effectiveness compared to usual care. So on this figure, um, the beige um, uh, bars are the impact or collaborative care arm, and usual care is in the purple arm. So that means that in typical usual care, only about 20% of patients are getting better. And I think that that's a really important fact to understand because that means even if a patient has made it into primary care, the chances that they'll actually have improvement for their depression are pretty low um, unless you start thinking about some of these more systematic measures to actually make sure that they're getting better. Um, and collaborative care is one of those strategies to improve um, the, the likelihood that a patient will improve. I think this is really important data to understand that this happened in a wide variety of organizations. So there were eight different settings. Um, these were small rural to larger urban practices, um, kind of no matter what size practice it was or what usual care was available, um, collaborative care still outperformed that in this trial. Um, so this is, um, you know, one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about taking collaborative care and collaborative care principles and making sure that we're thinking about how do we get them implemented out in our community setting. So in addition to improved depression, um, patients reported less physical pain, better functioning, and higher quality of life. Um, I really like the image here of the patient. I mean, that's the purpose of really um, delivering um, um, collaborative care is to get patients um, back living their lives, and that's going to be really important when you think about suicide prevention, right? Because when people are depressed, they become hopeless. Um, that puts them at greater risk for wanting to act on suicidal ideation. Um, collaborative care also um, demonstrated greater patient and provider satisfaction, um, and there were data that showed that if you do deliver collaborative care, um, it also allows you to reduce health care costs. Um, specifically, what they looked at in this study was they looked at the health care costs over the four years after collaborative care intervention was delivered, and they saw savings of a, about $6.5 to every dollar spent, um, and most of that was avoided physical health care costs. 
Um, again, I think we think about when we think about risk factors for suicide, um, addressing people's medical care so that they they actually have improvement in their medical conditions may also be protective um, against risk for suicide. Okay, so collaborative care has also been shown to um, be effective um, treatment for other conditions. So evidence base has been established for depression in a wide variety of populations, um, anxiety, post-traumatic traumatic stress disorder, chronic pain, dementia, and um, recently has several nice studies showing that this can be effective treatment for substance use disorders. Um, there's emerging evidence around um, ADHD and bipolar disorder. So um, I hope I've, you know, convinced you that uh, collaborative care uh, is an important strategy to think about when delivering mental health services in primary care settings. What do we think the secret sauce is for, for this type of care delivery? And what are those core things, because there's a lot of pieces to collaborative care that we think are really important to drive those improved outcomes. Um, the consent, there's been a consensus process that's really identified five um, core principles that I think are really important to think about when we think about delivering collaborative care. And I think if you're in a practice setting where collaborative care isn't possible tomorrow, thinking about which one of these or one of these principles at least that you might take and use in your setting can be a really important way to get started in collaborative care. Um, so these principles are really population-based care, identifying a population and using a registry to track and make sure no one falls through the cracks. Uh, that concept will also be really important when we talk about suicide prevention. Um, once somebody identified, is identified at risk, we really want to be able to track and make sure that we're continuing to engage them in care until we think um, that they're more stable. Measurement-based treatment to target. Um, I talked a little bit about why I think that's important, and I have a couple of my slides to explain that in a, in a few um, slides. Patient-centered team collaboration, you know, really using a team and wrapping that team around where the patient is likely to show up, uh, especially in primary care. Um, the ability to increase access to evidence-based care, both medication and psychotherapies. And then in most systems, when they do um, this model of care, they're not only looking at the individual patient levels, but also at the systems level and making sure that the, they're having good population impact um, and that enough patients are getting better. And that's really what we mean by accountable care. So I'm going to go through each of these principles and talk about what those strategies actually look like as part of the clinical care um, before I move on to thinking about how this can help with suicide prevention. Um, so the first um, principle is really population-based care. This is a figure from one of the registries that we use. This is a free registry that the AIM Center makes available that's based off of Excel. Um, and you can get a sense of how a registry could be such a powerful tool to help a team with doing proactive care for patients. So what you can see in this is um, each line going across is an individual patient. Um, and what you can see is you can actually sort the columns, for example, by PHQ-9, and that's what the, the purple arrow is pointing to. And what you can see there is that, that you can actually sort this column and quickly identify who are the patients that aren't improving? Um, who are the patients who still have a high PHQ-9 score indicating that they still have active depression symptoms? Um, and it can allow you to make sure that you actually address those patients' needs, make a change in treatment, intensify treatment, and that you're trying to get that patient better. We also use our registry to indicate patients that we need to um, keep a close eye on. So in this particular registry, all the way over on the right-hand side, um, there's actually these different colored boxes. And that red box there actually indicates that that patient has had been identified as, as having some safety risk. And that allows the team to quickly see who are the patients we need to pay extra attention to in a systematic way to make sure that we're able to address um, any increased risk for suicidality. The next um, principle that I want to talk about is measurement-based treatment to target. Um, this has been shown to be an effective strategy. I think this is a really nice patient case that I'll spend a couple minutes talking about because I really want to give a sense of how collaborative care can help deliver measurement-based treatment to target. Um, this was an actual patient that I was taking care of. It was a young woman. Um, we know that transitional age youth can, can be a population that we really um, can sometimes be difficult to engage in treatment. Um, she'd shown up in her primary care provider's office um, 
reporting that she was feeling like depression was really getting in the way of her effectively being able to um, participate in school. She was enrolled in college. And it was a pretty high-stakes situation in that she was at risk for losing her financial aid uh, if she didn't complete this semester. And she was really worried that her depression uh, was going to prevent her from doing that. Uh, she was identified by her primary care provider as um, likely having depression, seen by a behavioral health care manager actually that day. Um, that behavioral health care manager administered a PHQ-9, and she had a score of 15. Also administered a screener for anxiety, um, screened for bipolar disorder, and for PTSD. Um, this is a safety net population that had a high prevalence of, of trauma. Um, after that assessment, the care manager really felt that this was depression with secondary anxiety because of all the stress um, and worry this patient had about um, her schooling. Um, the patient um, and the and the behavioral health care manager talked about her treatment plan and really decided um, that the patient's preference was to start with psychotherapy, and they started that psychotherapy that day um, doing some basic CBT. I was a psychiatric consultant, and I talked to the care manager a few days later. Um, I said, that sounds like you did a nice assessment. I agree with your assessment. I think this is a reasonable plan. I planted the seed that if the patient doesn't get better, since it's such a high-risk situation, we should probably consider medications as an augmentation strategy sooner rather than later if she isn't responding to the CBT. Uh, the care manager saw her again the next week. Um, her score for her PHQ-9 had come down a little bit. You can see it came down to 12. I think the patient was really relieved that she was engaged in treatment. Um, but when the care manager checked in with her the next week, she actually said she wasn't doing as well as she reported that last visit. Um, she was actually really struggling to do her CBT homework and was quite worried. Uh, the care manager reached out to me and said, you know, do you think this is the time to think about medications? And I said, absolutely. Um, here's my recommendations. Let's start some fluoxetine. Um, the PCP can prescribe that. Um, let's start at 10, make sure she tolerates it, have her go up to an effective dose at 20 as soon as she tolerates it. Um, the care manager, you know, made sure that that happened. The nurse reached out to the patient, made sure that prescription happened. Um, and about a week later, the care manager called the patient. The patient actually said, my symptoms are still pretty high. You can see she had a 17 on her PHQ-9. I don't think this medication's working, um, which isn't surprising for most patients. They don't see benefit in that first week. But because we had that care manager, because we were doing that measurement-based treatment to target over time, that care manager had an opportunity to say, that's really normal to provide some psychoeducation. That's normal that you're not going to respond right away. Um, but we can actually... Um, that's actually a good sign that you're tolerating the medication. We can go up to the effective dose. I'm going to talk to your team about giving you instructions on how to do that. And what we saw is that the patient then actually had a pretty rapid response over the next few weeks. Um, the care manager checked in with her one more time by phone, and the patient said she was doing much better. Um, she came back into the clinic about a month later, and by that point, her PHQ-9 had dropped to four, um, which is considered um, a response to treat, uh, remission of her depression symptoms. And I think that this is a really nice story of a couple of things. Um, first, that it took a couple of trials and a couple of changes to get this patient onto the right medicine. Uh, and so making sure that we had a systematic way to make sure that happened was really important for her to be able to have a timely intervention around her depression. Um, I think it also points out that, you know, having somebody who's tracking that and using those data to actually make sure those interventions or those changes happen is really critical if you want patients to actually um, have an effective response to treatment. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for psychoeducation, I think you can hear in this. I think you can also imagine that if this was a patient who also had reported some passive suicidal ideation, you can see how that frequent contact um, by that care manager would be a really important strategy um, to make sure that you can monitor her, her response to that. Um, so I think you can think about not only how does this help this patient get effective depression treatment, but how these same structures would be useful for patients at risk for suicide. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to show some other data. This is from the Mayo Clinic. It's a really nice paper that showed that when they delivered collaborative care in their system to over 7,000 patients, what they found is that patients that had collaborative care got better in about three months or 86 days compared to almost two years for patients without collaborative care. So it's not that patients won't get better from their depression. It's just going to take a long time. And you can imagine a patient that's at risk for suicide. It would make a big difference in their risk if you can get them better in 90 days versus almost two years. 
Uh, the next principle is patient-centered team collaboration. I think you've gotten a nice sense from um, the stories that I've already described of how really having that patient and that primary care provider um, getting support from the care manager and the psychiatric consultant can make a big difference. Um, I think it's also important because it allows the patient to really have access to a full range of treatment options. Uh, the next principle is really evidence-based mental health treatment, and I, I think that that's really important. I think that provides the opportunity to use our full range of medication and psychotherapy options to help patients get better. Um, I think getting access to care is a huge deal. Um, for many patients, they may not be able to make it into specialty settings directly, and so if we think about mental health um, diagnoses as a huge risk factor for suicide, getting access to effective treatment for um, their mental health something that really um, collaborative care offers a tremendous opportunity. Um, and I think that's really what, you know, I, I'm trying to focus on is that, you know, if you think about treating patients for depression and anxiety, we really need a biopsychosocial approach that you want to make that full range of treatment options available. Um, you really want to support the whole person. There may be social factors that are also important to consider. Um, you can think about how this is really important when you would also might be addressing concurrently um, suicide risk factors, um, you know, thinking about that full person um, and how you might uh, approach multiple risk factors um, at the same time um, is really important. And having someone that's designated in primary care to actually support the delivery, um, to be able to have time to discuss pros and cons and really engage patient in treatment is one of the real advantages of, primary, of collaborative care. Um, the last principle is accountable care, and I really think about increasing access. Um, you know, you often have to think about as you design um, your care delivery system, how are we going to help as many patients as possible with often limited resources? Um, and collaborative care really leverages some of the scarce resources in our systems. Um, there are just not enough psychiatrists in the country to actually provide direct services. Um, and so thinking about how do you leverage limited psychiatric expertise and also leverage that over distances through mechanisms like telepsychiatry um, can really help think about access issues. Um, we also make sure that there's accountability. Um, we make sure that we're screening patients to identify all those patients in need. And then we're really measuring to make sure that at both a patient and a population level, we're getting enough patients better. So many times in collaborative care systems, we'll look at things like, are we hitting that benchmark of getting at least 50% of the patients to show improvement in their collaborative care, um, in their depression treatment? So um, I, I think that's really the core principles of collaborative care, and I, I hope that I've um, convinced you that there's some interesting ideas in there, no matter what your setting, that you might want to think about. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about why I think this is relevant to uh, suicide prevention. I think there are, you know, there are many disparities in access to mental health care, and especially for members of racial and ethnic minority groups in the United States. They're less likely to have access to mental health services, less likely to use community mental health services. Services, um, more likely to use, you know, inpatient hospitalization and emergency rooms, um, and more likely um, to receive lower quality care. So thinking about is collaborative care an opportunity to also increase um, or address disparities um, in mental health care is really important. And we have some, you know, important reasons to do that when you think about suicide. Um, we know that our some of our racial and ethnic groups are at risk um, for suicide, um, especially um, American Indian, Alaska Native youth. Um, and thinking about how could collaborative care possibly be an opportunity to both engage people in more effective mental health treatment, um, but also potentially in suicide prevention. So I want to talk a little bit about the evidence base around collaborative care for disparity populations. Um, this first figure comes from the IMPACT trial. Um, they actually looked at the individual racial and ethnic groups um, and, and what their responses were. Um, and you can see that, you know, for both black and Latino populations, they had just as much benefit, if not in some cases, um, a, you know, even more benefit um, from um, having access to collaborative care. And I think that that's a really uh, important um, thing to appreciate is that um, improving access to collaborative care is a way to address disparities in mental health access potentially. Um, I also have done some work um, locally in our Washington State program, which is called the Mental Health Improvement Program, 
Um, I was fortunate enough to serve in a culturally sensitive clinic for um, Asian um, populations um, in in Seattle. And um, that that clinic actually, um, we were really curious about: do we get the same outcomes um, in the that patient population as we do to other populations served by this program? And what we found, um, just to kind of, this is a busy table, but to, to, to break it down is that essentially we had the same outcomes, whether you're an Asian American or um, a white patient served in these populations. Um, but what we really saw is that we got so many more patients um, engaged in mental health care by offering collaborative care in that culturally sensitive clinic. And so one of the things that I want people to take away from this is that by if you have a, a clinic that serves a disparity population, offering collaborative care there is a huge opportunity to offer access to effective mental health treatment. Um, we also have um, emerging data that's not quite published yet, um, but was part of a really um, interesting implementation project that the AIM Center has been involved in over the last five or so years called the Social Innovation Fund, um, and you can read more about that project on the AIMS website. Essentially, this was an implementation of collaborative care in um, clinics in the rural West, so these were really trying to understand what are the adaptations we need to be able to implement collaborative care in pretty hard-to-serve populations with very limited access to mental health services. Um, and one of the exciting um, opportunities that we had to learn from in this clinic, in this implementation, was that a large percentage of the patients were American Indian and Alaska Native, and it was really um, one of the larger populations we've had a chance to evaluate. And what we've seen in the early analyses is that um, we're seeing good outcomes in those populations comparable to um, between the American Indian Native Alaska um, population and the white population, um, which would be consistent with what we've seen in other populations and really um, I think is an important opportunity to think about if we're trying to improve access to mental health treatment um, for our disparity populations. Um, the last slide that I'll just show is, is more work that's been done from our mental health improvement project in Washington State. Um, and this was really just to address that sometimes there are high risk populations. Um, and this particular population is high-risk mothers um, in, in King County. Um, and uh, this program specifically targeted engaging these populations. Um, and what they found is that um, in, in all of the populations, we saw um, significant improvement of depression when that population was engaged in this treatment. Um, so I'm really, uh, you know, I think this was a really important um, uh, set of data because if you think about the opportunity when you're addressing um, a mother who has depression, you're not only improving her um, outcomes of mental health, but you're also probably improving um, the, the outcomes of mental health for her child. And so um, when we think about what are the kinds of populations that we really want to target uh, with collaborative care, to me, um, high-risk mothers, um, perinatal and postpartum depression um, is a particularly important population to be thinking about. It's also an important population from a suicide prevention um, perspective. Um, interestingly, perinatal women, sort of that year um, after childbirth, are, uh, um, you know, that, that suicide is actually more likely to cause a death in that population than um, hemorrhage, which is what people usually think of as a complication of childbirth. Um, so really thinking about how, you know, addressing depression in this population is not only helping with mental health access, but is probably also um, potentially addressing suicide um, risk. Okay, so I think there's a lot of opportunities within collaborative care um, and the implementation of collaborative care um, to uh, go after suicide prevention. And a lot of that has to do with reducing suicidal ideation and effectively treating depression and anxiety and other common mental health disorders. I think one of the exciting things that I've had the opportunity to do within the collaborative care realm, though, is really think about um, how do we change systems? Um, you can tell from my descriptions of collaborative care that there's a lot of different things that you're doing differently when you're actually delivering collaborative care. You have to change your workflows. You change your team. Um, and as you're actually making all those changes, if you're thinking about 
the opportunities for suicide prevention as part of those, I think you have an opportunity to really change things at the healthcare level. So I'm going to talk through three um, main areas that I think um, I, are really um, key opportunities within the implementation of collaborative care um, that go beyond just the, the opportunity that I described to improve depression treatment. So the first one of these is really the opportunity to train primary care providers. I think one of the really um, powerful experiences I've had in the last couple of years was to, to be asked to design um, a training for primary care providers for the University of Washington. Um, so in Washington State, we actually have a law that requires all providers to have six hours, um, all medical providers, to have six hours of um, uh, suicide prevention training. Um, and in designing a program for this, I really had a lot of opportunity to think about what are the key skills that the average primary care provider needs in order to really be making a meaningful contribution um, to suicide prevention. Um, and as a result of that, we created this six-hour um, course. And in the next few slides, you'll actually see some of the, the um, materials from that um, presentation. If you're interested in knowing more about that course, we do have the um, web address there, and it is a course that people can register um, and take. Um, what I um, think about is that we really felt like one of the things we wanted to talk about is sort of how do you recognize, and then how can you meaningfully manage, what can you manage in a primary care setting? So there's a lot of opportunity um, to actually think through that. So I'm going to talk about a few of the highlights in the next few slides. I guess I feel like as you're talking about how do we do better depression treatment, talking about how do you do good suicide risk assessment and management is, is something that you should be doing as part of every collaborative care implementation. Um, so, you know, the reason I think that this is important is that medical professionals are trusted professionals, um, and they often are treating the conditions that increase risk for suicide, um, both mental health and the physical health reasons, um, and that, you know, Medical providers, I think, if properly empowered, can really be a key source of, um, uh, of uh, being a trusted relationship that can be leveraged when a patient is at risk for suicide. They often have long-term relationships with their patients. Um, lastly, I'll just say, you know, the medical profession itself is a population that is and can be at high risk for suicide themselves. Um, so there may also be the opportunity in that training um, to pre prevent the death of a colleague. Um, so I think that's another reason why it's really important to think about suicide prevention in primary care settings. Um, you know, what, are, what, what can a medical professional do? Um, thinking about how to educate patients to make homes safer. Um, we prescribe medications. Medications are um, part, you know, of the, the most common um, means used to make a suicide attempt. Um, people often are using medication overdoses. So talking about both how does, a, how does a patient keep themselves safe, but also how do they make their home safe? You know, who accesses their home? Are there kids or teenagers that might be at risk that might have access to medications um, in, you know, medicine cabinets? Um, how can you actually keep those safe can be part of a public health um, conversation. Um, thinking about how do you identify and screen for patients at risk, and we talked a little bit about that. There's an increasing... Um, I'll talk about this another slide, but there's a lot more emphasis on screening for depression in primary care, and with that comes the opportunity to screen for patients at risk for suicide. Um, really training people to be comfortable asking directly um, and assessing uh, risk for suicide. I think it's really important that people get comfortable asking, are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about dying by suicide? Um, you know, in the context of a trusted relationship can be really important. I think sometimes people can be um, cautious and say things like, are you thinking about hurting yourself? And really correcting that that's not an adequate assessment of suicide is really an important opportunity for training. Uh, giving people practical strategies for safety planning and removing dangers, removing means, removing access to means is really important. Giving people a chance to practice that skill um, can be a really key um, training need for, for prov medical providers. Um, talking about how do you facilitate next steps to care and actually how do you track patients to make sure that once you've identified a patient at risk, you keep them on your radar and keep them engaged in care can be really important. And then, of course, thinking about how do we engage our medical professionals and really being the practice champions for the kinds of changes you need to support systematic suicide prevention. <laughs> 
Um, there's practical tools that are easy and free and available. So the SafeTea is a really good um, example of that. Um, the SafeTea um, is freely available. Um, it helps with kind of walking a provider through um, a good suicide assessment um, for evaluation and kind of triaging to the right level of care. Um, this, in combination with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, can be a good place to start for any practice. I also think um, getting people comfortable using tools like the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale to help with that assessment of suicide um, is a really important opportunity within primary care settings. Um, this is a great tool. It's six questions. It's fast. It kind of gives guidance about what are questions that would put that person in the higher risk category. Um, and then, you know, practical steps really, you know, you have to think about screening, and then you have to think about assessment. And so if you can teach people um, these two things, I think you really um, have gone pretty far, and so that's a real opportunity. Um, this is what a good safety plan includes. I think making sure everyone knows this, thinking about how could safety planning tools be embedded in uh, um, electronic medical records um, or, you know, put it as a paper copy within your practice settings is a great place to start um, in terms of thinking about planning steps. Okay, um, so I think the second opportunity that primary care really represents, and I've talked about this throughout the presentation, is to increase the detection of patients at risk in primary care settings. And a huge opportunity comes um, from using the PHQ-9. This is a tool that's now widely used in primary care settings. Um, and question nine on this questionnaire um, uh, actually um, talks about, you know, why um, you'd want to, you know, the thoughts that you'd, would be better off dead or that you would in some way want to hurt yourself. Um, if somebody's positive on this, they need additional assessment that day. So if a practice is really going to implement broad screening for depression using the PHQ-9, they also need to have enhanced um, protocols to be able to then assess any person um, that ends up testing positive on this PHQ-9. And so I think talking about suicide prevention in the context of increased depression screening is really important. Um, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force rep recommends depression screening um, in a general adult population and specifically calls out pregnant and postpartum women. Um, and they basically say screening should be implemented with adequate systems to place in place to ensure accurate diagnosis, effective treatment, and appropriate follow-up. Um, collaborative care is a strategy that allows you to really um, be able to do that. Um, there also are metrics um, now that are associated, um, and many organizations are um, actually using these metrics to measure the quality in their clinics. Um, this is the depression remission and response. Um, so I also think as people are thinking about um, using these kinds of metrics or, you know, entering into financial arrangements like accountable contracts that include these metrics, thinking about how do you build the systems to address um, patients at risk for suicide as part of meeting these metrics is really important. Um, and the last piece that I'll focus on is that often when you're ch doing changes in your system of care to be able to deliver good um, collaborative care, you're going to have the opportunity um, to also do systems changes that can improve protocols um, and healthcare systems approaches. Um, this is a, a screenshot from a recent report um, uh, released from the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention. Uh, it has some really nice high-level recommendations around places to get started um, depending on your practice setting. Uh, and I think it can be a really nice opportunity uh, to actually think about the systems level changes that need in, to be in place to really accomplish suicide prevention. Uh, these are the kinds of things that each clinic system should really be thinking about. How are you going to screen and identify for patients at risk at suicide, especially important in primary care settings? How will providers be trained and empowered to support patients at risk? You know, how are you going to make sure that the providers know how to engage in a therapeutic and empathetic way with their patients? How is your practice going to gather appropriate information um, once a patient has been identified at risk? Are you going to use the Columbia um, Suicide Severity Rating Scale? Are you going to use other things? Are those already in your EHR? Or are they in the practice rooms? Um, and then how are you going to actually manage any patient that does need to be at risk? You know, how is a patient going to be um, transported to an emergency department if they need that level of care versus being followed up closely in their outpatient setting? 
Um, removal of danger and, and plan for safety. Do you have a good um, strategies to actually help support means removal? Do you have information on how to lock and limit access to firearms or lock or limit access to medications? Um, how are you going to have generate a good safety plan? I think um, it's really important that safety plans are developed developed collaboratively um, with a patient um, and making sure that you do that in an effective way that people feel comfortable with being able to do that is important. Um, and how will you address um, uh, getting a patient to a hospital setting if that's what they need, if that level of risk is, is present in a patient, especially in a primary care setting? And most importantly to me, I think often, you know, systems are getting better at, at sort of managing that immediate acute kind of phase of a patient at risk for suicide, but I really think thinking about how do you make sure that patient gets continuous care um, is really important. How are you going to bring, if you're in a primary care setting, how are you going to know what patients might have been assessed in an emergency setting, and how are you going to make sure that in that 72 hours after they leave the hospital, to get them um, back connected to care, because that's a super high risk time for patients, right? How are you going to make sure that if you send a patient home from an outpatient setting that you have timely follow-up to make sure whatever level of support you gave them was enough um, to start to see that change um, in their suicidal ideation happen? Um, how are you going to make sure a patient that might have a mental health condition actually gets effectively engaged in treatment? Um, to me, these are really important things that can only be addressed at a systems level. And so really thinking about how do we create systems of care um, that can deliver these kinds of elements as a real opportunity, and while you're already changing your care to deliver collaborative care, you can incorporate these ideas into that. Um, tools like the registry, as I already showed you, can be effective to help um, with these kinds of strategies. Um, and lastly, I really think that there's the opportunity with systems change to engage um, anyone in the system to become a practice champion. I think often um, we think that patients, um, you know, um, are at risk and we sort of feel alone with them. Um, but I think as a medical provider, anyone can be a practice champion. Um, and if people are needing help with that, I, there are so many great resources now available um, for clinics and practices. Um, we have some as part of our All Safe, Patient Safe um, tools, but there's great free resources from the Zero Suicide um, movement, and I just think that there's, uh, I really encourage you if you're excited about this idea of how can your system really become a, a system that supports suicide prevention, um, please go look at those um, free resources because I just think there's a lot of opportunity um, for implementation at this point. So um, that's really, the, you know, my key points. I think that there's really a huge opportunity um, within um, collaborative care to think about suicide prevention, both directly in terms of increasing access to um, effective treatment for depression and other common mental health disorders. I think there's a huge opportunity because we see that patients have reduced suicidality when they get their mental health disorders treated. I think that there's huge opportunities in, in movements around um, increased screening, uh, increased training for medical providers, and increased uh, systems level approaches. Um, I've been excited to actually partner with the National Institute of Mental Health and the Health Resources and Services Administration, so NIMH and HRSA, um, on this partnership um, around the implementation of collaborative care um, in HRSA nurse-led safety clinics. All of these clinics um, uh, Andrea mentioned this project at the beginning. Um, it's been really exciting to work with these 11 clinics throughout the United States um, and their ability to um, deliver collaborative care um, to disparities populations. Uh, and I think it's a really nice um, example of how um, a strong partnership can help support uh, effective implementation um, of a really important model of care. Okay. So um, that's about the time that I wanted to spend um, presenting, and I, I'm just leaving this up that we have um, lots of resources around how you can implement collaborative care on the AIMS website. I've also put um, our suicide prevention um, training program website up in case people want to look at that. Um, I want to acknowledge all the good work of the um, faculty and staff that I work with here at the AIMS Center and University of Washington. Um, as well as the partnership with Forefront Suicide Prevention that's in the University of Washington School of Social Work um, for all the good thinking and partnership around um, 
much of the material that I presented here today. And I'm really excited um, to have a good amount of time to um, address questions that have come in, and I see that there are a few that have come in. Um, and then I will um, be happy to answer additional questions. Um, and I will turn it over to Andrea to kind of facilitate that section. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. I really appreciate uh, your enthusiasm and passion about um, using this uh, powerful tool to help us to reduce suicide uh, in U.S. and overseas. Uh, I think um, you were, you know, you give an amazing uh, presentation, giving us a little bit of like overview about the collaborative care, uh, well, how this evidence-based intervention can help us. And NIH, as you mentioned, NIH and other agencies have already um, um, funded uh, almost 100 randomized control trials showing that uh, collaborative care, when implemented with fidelity, works. So know the next step now and how to implement them. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, that's one of our partnerships that we are doing with HRSA and you, uh, in a sense of helping to implement collaborative care in uh, 11 -led, uh, nurse-led clinics around the U.S. So without, uh, we have some time now, and I will see I will have it with some questions. Um, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna uh, um, read this, those questions so everybody can, um, can can know can know and and Anna's gonna be addressing that. So Anna, um, what the first question is how collaborative care uh, is uh, superior to integrated care and where mental health professionals are co-located co members of the primary care treatment team. Great. So um, I, I guess I will address that um, question by really saying um, I think that. Um, there are lots of ways that people are trying to uh, think about integrated mental health, and there's lots of different models and approaches that I think are really helpful um, for patients. I'll talk about a few of the things that I think um, distinguish collaborative care from more general integration models. And, and part of how I think about this is um, that there are actually um, – uh, uh, I, I think there are, there is sort of the physical location of people, and so um, I think that's one dimension of integration, right? So if if people are physically located in the same place, mental health providers into the primary care setting, I think that's a really good first step in a lot of cases because that actually allows for there to be um, collaboration. Um, there, there allows for there to be possibly increased communication um, just because you're in closer proximity. However, um, I think without some of the systems level changes that happen in collaborative care, um, it can be hard to overcome some of the, you know, you can still end up being pretty siloed um, in an integrated setting, um, even if, you know, you're co-located. So um, what, I, what I would really say are the distinguishing features of collaborative care are those measurement-based treatment to target and the systems to make sure that that happens routinely. Um, so, for example, having a registry, for example, helps make sure that every patient that's identified that's put on that registry, you have an opportunity to track their response to treatment over time and kind of prioritize those patients who aren't getting better um, to be e effectively engaged in care. And some other models of integration, there isn't necessarily that systematic approach to make sure whatever intervention um, you give on that day is actually something that results in, in an improved outcome. So I think all integration is really um, a huge opportunity. I think there's some systems level things about collaborative care that probably drives the outcomes, the, the improved outcomes that we've seen um, in, collaborative, in the collaborative care research. Thank you, Anna. Um, our next question is uh, somebody is asking us, uh, you, uh, what, what type of mental health provider uh, typically serve as the, the, the healthcare manager? Um, and uh, what, what would be the, so yeah, let, first this yeah. let's go for it. Yeah, so I, I, I see this question. It's really around who might serve in that behavioral healthcare manager role. So. Um, in most um, implementations of collaborative care, um, we really think of that role as having two functions. Um, and most of the time that's 
can be, you know, in most implementations, that's one person. Um, it can sometimes be, you know, more than one person that, that shares tasks. But the two tasks are really somebody to own that measurement-based treatment to target to make sure routine measures are addressed, that they're collected in the registry, um, that there's coordination of care between all the team members. So that, that kind of behavioral health care manager function is one um, really important role for that person. The second part of that um, and, um, is the ability to deliver good evidence-based brief behavioral interventions. Um, so typically that needs to be a provider type that it's within the scope of practice for that provider um, to both do assessment um, and delivery of, of therapeutic intervention. So there's some variability across states, um, different states, on who, who are eligible providers to be in that role. Um, so those are, it's important to understand your local state politics. Um, in our state, Washington State, um, we often have licensed social workers in that role. We see nurses in that role that have had behavioral health training. Um, occasionally, we'll see a psychologist in that role. Typically, those are folks that are um, psychologists are often more likely to be reserved to deliver longer-term psychotherapy for patients or evidence-based behavioral interventions. Um, there are new um, collaborative care billing codes that are available, and for those codes, there is some more definition of who can serve in that behavioral health um, care manager role. Um, so I w if you're thinking about billing, billing for collaborative care, it would be important to understand those differences. Um, there are specific rules for FQHCs and RHCs that really allow kind of a broad range of providers to be in that role. Really, the guidance is around somebody with a bachelor's level with specialized behavioral health training. Um, in non-FQHC or RHC settings, uh, rural health center settings, um, the, that um, language is a little bit more um, uh, aligned with somebody that's more like a master's level person. But um, I would refer to you to also, um, I would encourage people to actually look at that. What I'll say practically, because I've done a lot of implementation around this, is that you need a person in that role um, who's flexible and organized um, and somebody who has enough training in at least a few um, evidence-based brief behavioral interventions, at least one, um, but ideally a couple, um, that really feels comfortable delivering those in a, in a very different way than you might if you're in a traditional mental health setting. Um, so we've seen... Um, you know, people, great people coming from emergency settings, things like that. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, so I'm going to ask now ask a very practical question that is coming. Uh, yep. And I know that you're going to be able to help us to answer that. And, and, and I think that's one of the questions that people get really uh, uh, concerned uh, as working in the primary care center who does not have experience in mental health and, and with suicide. And that's why this, we are addressing this. Uh, so the question is after a primary care, a primary care physician um, screen for suicide, assess the patient, uh, and the patient is, is, is for risk of suicide, so what's the next step? What I'm going to do? Right. So that's great. So I think um, that's one of the reasons why I think talking about suicide prevention protocols are really important because I think having a plan in that practice um, before you're faced with that patient for the first time is really important. Um, and I'll kind of talk about two scenarios because I think there's two different um, settings where you could imagine that. And I work with all of these. So the, the first setting um, might be a, you know, a clinic that does have an embedded behavioral health provider, right? So, I mean, somebody who might have a social worker or, or someone on staff who might be available to assist with them. So often in those clinic situations, if that person is identified at risk, they might have a warm handoff to that behavioral health provider um, for support around doing additional assessment. I think it's really important to emphasize that just because a patient has reported a positive response on a PHQ-9 question 9, for example, that doesn't equate with needing an assessment in an emergency room. So often that patient can be assessed and even managed in the primary care setting. And it's really important to build our systems capacity um, to be able to do that effectively um, because otherwise we're just um, filling up our ERs and, and that isn't necessarily uh, therapeutic for the patient or um, helpful for our systems of care. So, um, in, you know, in a system where you have a behavioral health provider, that might include a warm handoff. Um, typically, that involves doing a, a careful assessment of additional um, risk factors, protective factors, um, and past history of suicide attempts, and current assessment of intention and plan um, and sort of um, acuity of that, the, that suicidal ideation. 
Um, because really a question, a positive question on the PHQ-9 can range from anything from occasionally I wake up and I wish I wasn't alive to I have a gun at my house and I'm thinking about her, to, you know, dying tonight. Um, and, and it's really important because those are very different situations and you have to be able to, um, in a nuanced way, figure out where that patient is and what would be the appropriate level of care. Um, Specific tools that are helpful for that are that safety and the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. So I see a lot of practices using that combination to be able to complete that assessment and then a risk determination process. Um, so that's one scenario. The second scenario is your primary care provider, and I work with a lot of these in a two-person practice in the middle of rural Washington, and there is no one else for miles around you, and you have a patient who's just now reported a positive score on a PHQ-9. And for that primary care provider, they're probably going to need to develop some level of comfort of doing that assessment themselves. So I, this is where I really think making sure that we have primary care providers that are getting comfortable um, with the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, comfortable um, with taking that safety and really making a suicide risk assessment and determining level of care. You know, mild cases probably need, you know, follow-up, but not immediate follow-up. Moderate cases, um, you know, sorry, in any case, I think you need a safety plan. Um, and so making sure a primary care provider can do that. Um, some of that safety planning may improve include means removal, so I think you have to develop some comfort with that. Um, and I think some of the patients will actually need transfer to emergency services and you're going to need a plan for how to do that. Um, in all of these cases, if a primary care provider is ever stuck and not quite sure what to do next, they can always call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And so I think that's a really important number. Um, every time I start with an implementation, I make sure that everybody has that number right away um, because that is a way to get some guidance. Um, and, you know, that primary care provider can call right there with the patient in the room and they can work through um, trying to come up with some next steps if they're at a loss. So um, that's kind of my default, but I think it's also important to develop capacity to manage some of those patients in primary care themselves. I think we have that number on the screen. Uh, if we don't, if we do, I'm going to ask them to put it on uh, Great. on the slides. Um, yep. um Kelly, if you can help us with that, while I'm going to read the next uh, question. Uh, and I and I see here there is a lot of uh, like very practical questions, and I like that because then it's a real world, like what how we're going to be working with this and how this can help us, right? Um, and uh, so, and there's another question that I think is very interesting, and I've already thought about it. So like, I mean, in a primary care setting, the patient kind of has a contact with so many different uh, levels of people, from the nurse, from uh, start, starting with the receptionist, and so on. And so, and uh, how? So the question is, how many of those staff members who's going to be working with the patient? Uh, how much? Uh, how much they have to be trained on the collaborative care model? and how to be helping the patient also, who is going to be connecting with him, what is the patient thinks about the collaborative care model, how do you work with this? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So, um, so you know, I, what, one of the things we talk about is that when you actually develop collaborative care or any integration of mental health services into a primary care setting, we think really the entire team, which includes the entire primary care provider staff um, pool, needs to have some level of um, exposure to both what you're doing, um, you know, what your model of integration is, and what to do if you identify a patient that you're worried about for whatever reason, whether it's, um, you know, being at risk, worried that they're at risk for suicide or they're reporting suicidality to you to, um, you know, if there's just some other concern about how to engage patients or take care of patients. Um, what's really interesting is I think often those front desk staff people, appointment schedulers, um, uh, medical assistants can be the one that a patient might disclose something to or might be the person that noticed a, a change in behavior. I mean, my sense is from working in a lot of primary care settings that um, we have incredibly astute front desk staff and medical assisting staff, and they often know the patients really well and might be the team member that notices, gosh, that person seems you know, more anxious today or, you know, more hopeless today or maybe that person makes the offhand comment to the medical assistant and not just the um, 
and not the medical provider. Um, so one of the things I really encourage teams to think about is when you develop safety protocols, really um, both having a, uh, a, a pathway for if somebody who's a non-clinician um, identifies a patient at risk, how they connect that person, um, what, how's that handoff, how's that transfer of information going to happen in the clinic, um, and also that everyone in the clinic is aware of what the, how you manage suicide and, and patients at risk in that, in that clinic. So I, I love this question because I think it's absolutely true um, that the person at risk might not be the person that has the most training. Um, who notices the person at risk might not be the person with the most training. Um, it's interesting. In Washington State, they actually have required basically suicide prevention training of any medical professional at any level, um, and even pharmacists, OTs, PTs, dentists, everyone, because essentially – you know, we don't know who the patient is going to actually confide in or um, talk to. And so I think for everyone to feel like they have a role in suicide prevention is really important. So um, great question. I think everybody should really receive some level of training. I don't think we'd expect a medical assistant to actually manage a patient at risk, but we would want them to know what to do if they were the one that identified a patient at risk. Thank you. So uh, another very interesting question, and uh, something that we've been talking before uh, we opened this, this webinar with Anna, is about using collaborative care in other settings outside the U.S. And uh, I and I'm going, we're going to be able to share with you some uh, papers, recent papers, also showing how we are having this uh, bidirectional um, modeling of like uh, bringing collaborative care outside to other areas from U.S. in U.S and how can we have some models from that being used uh, outside the U.S. and bring it back to U.S., and how those things can help each other. So, but collaborative care has already been shown to be implemented in different areas, but the question, and Anne is going to be talking a little bit more about this, but the question is somebody from India, health service, uh, sorry, this is from India, and this is in, inside the U.S., I'm so sorry. Yes, that's uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but, um, this is from an Indian health service clinic uh, inside U.S. Uh, I'm sorry, I was thinking about India, <laughs> and I'm having a hard. So they are having a hard time to to buy in uh, from the primary care providers inside and in on those clinics. So, and that's another question that we are talking about. And how do you advise uh, people who want to start implementing those? How to get them on board on that? And uh, that's a very relevant question. And, and I think Anna will be able to help us give us some some answers. Yeah, I think that is a great question. So, um, uh, you know, we get a range of response when we're working with clinics around implementation from the primary care providers. I think uh, doing a good, getting a good understanding of what are the pain points or the challenges that those primary care providers are facing. Um, and, and trying to uh, think about uh, linkages between how collaborative care could be helpful um, for those challenges is going to be really important uh, in, in a good implementation. Um, I'll talk about a few key strategies that we found helpful with primary care providers. The first is that um, finding a champion from among the pool of primary care providers is really helpful. Um, so, you know, whether we like it or not, I think sometimes healthcare can be very tribal. Um, and, and really trying to think about, you know, who are the, the people, um, you know, who, who are the like-minded people that, that, you know, and identifying someone who's really a champion, um, from that group, um, to, to actually be the one that carries the messages back of excitement around, um, an implementation can be really helpful. Um, so I think, you know, it starts with a good needs assessment and then finding maybe somebody who's a champion um, among those. Who's the early adopter, right? So the other thing is that we all come with a range of comfort levels around change. Um, and my sense is that um, there are um, people who really um, are comfortable with change and are the people who are always wanting to do something new. And then there, there are people that are much more cautious adopters of something different. Um, so you want to find that early adopter and get them engaged. Um, I think often um, primary care providers, um, the, there's kind of two responses that I also get from primary care providers. One is, I'm already doing a good job taking care of my patients. And so one of the things, you know, and, and why do I need something new um, can be a response. And to that, I, I actually say, let's look at the data. If you are doing well already, then maybe you don't need something new. But 
odds are um, you're not getting quite as good an outcomes with your patients as you think you are because, honestly, none of us are. Um, I think almost, any, almost anywhere that you look, there's always opportunities to improve the number of people that are responding to treatment. Um, the, so that's, that's one thing. So getting good data from the clinic, what percentage of people have depression? What percentage of those patients actually achieved response or remission um, to their depression? And if you don't have those data saying, well, at the very minimum, we need collaborative care to be able to start to generate those data um, can be a really important engagement strategy. Um, the other thing that I, I sometimes get is discomfort with being in the prescriber role, really feeling much more comfort with referring that patient out to specialty behavioral health. And what I often then do is really talk about the reality of the lack of access to profession, you know, to, to referrals um, and some of the data that we have around patients actually following through. So the reality is I think sometimes a primary care provider can feel like they've met their obligation by putting the referral in. But if we look at that referral completion rate, um, data show you know about half of the patients at least don't follow through. That might be even lower for some mental health or substance use conditions. Um, and then when patients are referred, they may only go to two visits. Um, so one of the things I think is really important is that again, you know, if you have data on how many of the patients that pa a person has referred have actually made it to treatment. Um, or actually engaged in behavioral health. And if that number is low, saying, here's an opportunity to build some capacity here. You have a trusted relationship with your patient. Maybe we can, if we help you do this, this is something you can do here, um, can be another strategy to really engage primary care providers. So those are a few ideas. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, like, uh, uh, please feel free if you, if you want a uh, few more um, feedback from us, we can, uh, we can provide you later. Um, yeah, and I guess I want to just address the, the question you talked about, sort of international populations, because yeah. I think it's a really interesting yeah. point. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I, I guess I would say is um, I think collaborative care has been adopted and adapted for global settings, um, but there's also a lot we learn from um, those um, adaptations. Um, one of the things I really think is an interesting um, concept within collaborative care is this concept that is kind of the foundation of collaborative care that we're going to task share. That There's a series of tasks that need to be done to deliver effective care, and we're going to try to figure out who on our team can do them. So um, people always ask me, how does collaborative, you know, what, who exactly, what exactly should everybody be doing on the collaborative care team? And I'll actually say, well, actually, it looks a little different in every setting, uh, which is why we have principles, because we have to make sure those principles get done. Um, but honestly, how that actually gets put together um, in, in the different settings can actually look kind of different depending on, on that clinic setting. Um, and I think that's what we see when we see adaptations in global settings. A lot of times, um, you know, we're often use, using a licensed person in the role of the care manager. In many um, low-resourced um, settings um, in, in certain um, low-resourced countries, there is no licensed social worker to serve in the behavioral health care manager role. Um, and so one of the things that you see a lot in some of the global adaptations of collaborative care or collaborative care ideas is really thinking about who is available. And in a lot of those settings, it can be a community health worker. Um, and so you have seen some adaptations of really thinking about how much can you actually deliver? Um, can you adapt um, behavioral interventions to their sort of um, most essential core elements and teach a, someone with a fairly limited education how to deliver that behavioral intervention, for example, in primary care, thinking about things like behavioral activation, you know, thinking about how do we reactivate patients is something that a, a community health worker can be really well positioned to do. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities as we move forward and really try to think about addressing some of the implementation challenges around collaborative care. I think we're going to continue to have to get creative about how do we stretch and, and make a whole range of ways that we might um, engage patients, and, and maybe there are some ways to do that with um, uh, a, a range of um, staff and providers. So I think that's one of the exciting opportunities that comes out of some of the global work. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and I, I, I have also other questions that I just also want to address everybody that reminded that uh, uh, I just asked to put on, on the screen the, the, the phone number and the safety assessment, as Anna was talking about, uh, as an, an important uh, information to have. Um, and uh, all the, remind you also that the slides 
uh, and this webinar is go is being recording recorded uh, and is going to be storage archived in our web in our website. It's going to take a few weeks, uh, but uh, we're going to have that. Meanwhile, if you need anything, any piece of other information, we can provide you. Please send us an email. I'm going to also send my email uh, to, uh, to for you all to have it, and you have Anna's email. So our next question is, Anna, is that um, I, I was, you already answered a little bit about that, like the, some of the difference between collaborative care model and other models of uh, integ integration care. Uh, and uh, somebody is asking specifically about the mental health integration from Intermountain Health in Utah. Uh, so I don't know if you, you can address particularly about this one, but I would like you to, to sure. address this one. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of similarities between Intermountain and um, collaborative care. I think, again, um, I, I think each model has its own um, um, team and who they kind of divide up as roles um, on the team members. Um, so, um, my understanding of Intermountain is that they have pretty specific um, team roles um, for each of the um, provider types. Um, I know that they have built some infrastructure to do some registry type functions. I'm not particularly familiar with their particular registry. I, I haven't personally seen it, um, but I think that would be something, you know, that might be interesting to look at. Uh, my understanding is that they have an embedded um, behavioral health care manager kind of person, um, as well as um, uh, they often are using psychologists or social work in that role. Um, I think that's very similar to um, the collaborative care model. I think they may use a combination of a behavior, mental health provider and a care manager, um, whereas in sometimes in collaborative care, those are in one person. Um, I, I think that, you know, in many ways, there's a lot of similarities um, uh, between the, those models. Um, so those are a few uh, top things that I can and kind of think about. Um, some models are a little bit, um, and, and I think Intermountain is one of those in most of the implementations, um, are really focused on um, immediate access, so same-day access, um, you know, warm handoffs or warm connections to, to patients. Um, I think that's a, that's a really important strategy for engagement, so I'll just talk about that a little bit. Um, I think that, that, you know, in many cases, because the collaborative care um, care manager is embedded, there is the opportunity for warm connections or warm handoffs, so patients who might be identified um, being connected that day to a behavioral health provider. Uh, I think there's a lot of good reasons to think about doing that. I mean, one of the things we see is the longer the time is between a patient's identified and when they actually get care, the less the, you know, if that time is longer, then the chances of them actually effectively engaging go down and pretty, pretty precipitously, like, you know, even a couple of days can make a big difference about the likelihood that somebody will engage in care. Um, so the, the sooner we can get that person connected to, to behavioral health provider, if there's a need, the, the better. Um, so in that case, I think thinking about um, in collaborative care teams, one of the things they often have to work on in their workflows is kind of the tension between being reactive, being able to quickly um, see a patient, engage a patient, um, and the benefit of that in terms of engagement, and the work that needs to be done to be proactive, to be able to go out and get those patients who aren't coming in, um, who need re-engagement in care, or who need tracking and treatment over time. Um, so I guess I'll just say in any model, um, there's always going to be the tension between those two roles. And I think, you know, there's going to never be enough provider time and capacity to do everything. So um, most teams have to actually kind of think about, um, you know, where is their priority for their system of care? Does every provider do both of those things? Do they meet those engagement needs um, with the behavioral health care manager as part of a collaborative care team or use other resources? All of those are really important considerations as you're thinking about building your team. And especially if you're thinking about including suicide prevention as part of that. So I, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, import, what I always kind of come back to, no matter what model you're talking about, is what are your real goals for 
um, behavioral health integration, um, how are you thinking about your team in being able to um, achieve those goals, and how are you going to measure whether or not you got those goals? A really important function of collaborative care when we do implementations is to have metrics to make sure we're reaching the goals. A big metric that we often are focused on is patient outcomes. Are we getting enough of our patients better? We also look at patient access. Do we have enough patients being engaged in care? Um, if we're not seeing those numbers where we are, and, and typically a team is looking at that, you know, weekly or monthly, um, then we're thinking about what are our continuous quality improvement strategies to actually get those kinds of outcomes that we want to get. Um, so one of the things I always say is, you know, it's less important, in my opinion, what exactly the perfect model is um, if you're getting patients engaged in care and you're actually seeing the kinds of um, access levels and outcome levels that you're hoping to accomplish, um, that's where I really tend to focus on when I'm working with an implementation with a team. Thank you, Anna. Um, uh, just one more, one more, one more question, and then I, we're going to summarize. Um, so in your experience, because you've been implementing those um, um, poverty care in different areas with different communities, uh, in different places, what is the, what are the main challenges that you that you face um, when I know probably it's different different areas, but what is your the, one of the main challenges that you already face? I think the hardest. I mean, I think the hardest thing is changing, right? I mean, I think many people get very comfortable with delivering care um, in certain ways, and so thinking about um, becoming more protocolized, more systematic, can be hard. Um, I think thinking about, um, I mean, I, I would say there's kind of um, the the other thing that I would I would put in that category is I still think financing can be challenging around cl collaborative care and integrated care in general. Um, so I think really from the beginning of any effort, really thinking about financial sustainability and building a, a model or a system um, that's financially sustainable for your organization is really important. Um, I think your people are really important. So we see sometimes challenges with clinics either having a hard time hiring for a certain position or um, with when there's turnover in the team, that really being a threat to implementation. So, again, thinking about from the beginning, how are you going to train your team? How are you going to stay working and functioning as a good team together um, can be really important. Um, so those are a couple of areas that we often see um, practices struggle, and we often work hard to try to find ways to help them. Thank you, Anna. Um, so I have another question here before I go to some, start like summarizing and then we go to uh, finalize our. So there is somebody is asking uh, asking about uh, as the role of the the, the the care manager itself and how that can that how that role in the clinic can be uh, more official and how then you have a title on that how people are being paid on the system. So can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. I mean, I think one of the things is that um, this can be a really hard job, you know, trying to think about how do we give adequate recognition and compensation to the care managers, the behavioral health providers that are integrated is really important. Um, I'll, I mean, I don't have um, all the answers to this because that's obviously a huge challenge um, in systems to be thinking about. I think... Um, increasingly, organizations are going to be at risk for whole person care, and so I think there's going to be a lot of focus on, on organizations really thinking about how do they integrate behavioral health and physical health together, and I think it'll be important to make sure that as um, there's money tied to that, that some of that money gets to paying adequate salaries to the providers. So I, I don't have an easy way to do that. I think that's a lot of advocacy and policy work to do that. Um, the second thing that I'll say is that I think it can be kind of isolating to be the only behavioral health provider in a, a largely primary care setting. Um, and so one of the things we're trying to figure out is how do we create communities of people in that role across communities. And I think that's been one of the real benefits of some of the implementation projects that we have is that we often are kind of training care managers from a bunch of different clinic systems together, and they feel like they have um, kind of a community. Um, in Washington State, we're trying to think about how could we create um, programs, maybe something like an ECHO program, which is one of the things we've done in Washington State, to give people a sense of community 
across, you know, different um, primary care settings. So I do think trying to figure out how you can connect to a community so you aren't so isolated in that role can be a really important strategy um, to address some of the challenges um, that are coming up um, in this. I, I wish I had a perfect answer around the policy things. I think that's going to be longer um, and more challenging to address, but it is something I, I think people are thinking about. Thank you so much, Anna. So uh, for the interest of time, I'm going to just uh, briefly um, just, just summarize uh, a little bit of what we talked today and also uh, and more, I'm going to just share with you some other information that can be helpful for people who are interested in, in helping to reduce suicide in the U.S. and overseas. So just, um, I would, so I, I'm, I'm very happy and thank you again, Anna, for sharing with us so much information and your experience in um, implementing collaborative care uh, in clinics around the U.S. and other places. Um, so we, we learned today how collaborative care model as a systematic approach to improve care of, in, of depression and other common mental disorders, including suicide in primary care and the importance of that. We have evidence, it is an evidence-based inter uh, intervention that we can use uh, and I really uh, uh, appreciate if you can, uh, if you have for being here and listen to us. And if you have any other questions about that, please feel free to send us, ask us questions. I, I, I also add my email to, uh, to the, your access. You have an Anna's email. So we can provide you uh, reference papers and um, other contacts. I also want to remind you that, uh, as I mentioned, that September is Suicide Prevention Month. Uh, so we're going to be um, having a lot of um, information coming on. So I encourage you to visit our website. I'm going to also add the website here, uh, social media, and then you can connect us by Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Google, and LinkedIn. I also would like to highlight that our um, director, Dr. Gordon, um, has a Twitter account. Uh, so Dr. Uh, is the Twitter account is. Uh, at NIMH director, so you can also follow him, follow us, NIMH also the, on the Twitter. Uh, and I also want to highlight that our next webinar uh, is going to our next webinar is going to be September 11th at 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, and it's going to be about using stimulation to evaluate social determinants of health in people with mental illness and potential use of findings and discussions with policymakers, community workers, consumers, and advocates. That's going to be led by Dr. Margarita Alegria from uh, um, uh, Harvard, and uh, she's going to be joining with other speakers. It's going to be very exciting. How can we use big data and modern research techniques to, to help us to understand and address the social determinants of health? So please stay tuned. Uh, sign up for that too. I'm going to also we're going to say we're going to send you the the information above. And finally, I also want you to remind you that uh, in um, and for you to save the date that we're going to have our global mental health our uh, uh, global mental health conference that's going to be held in April 8 and 9, 2019. It's going to be called Global Mental Health Research Without Borders. Everybody is invited. It's free. It's a lot of resources uh, about all different kinds of uh, global mental health projects that's going on in U.S. and overseas. Uh, and uh, so, and to finalize, I really would like to thank you all uh, for your participation and your being here. Anna, thank you so much uh, for your kindness and sharing so much exciting uh, projects, programs, and research that you've been working with. Thank you. Thank. Thank you.